Well, welcome to the calculus book. And lesson one is going to be a review of real numbers and a fundamental concept review. This calculus book is designed for people who maybe want to be a mathematics major or students whose primary interests are in engineering, physics, business, life sciences like biology, or for people who just want to know God better by seeing that mathematics is a tool that we can use for studying his creation. Before we get started with the review in this lesson, let's just talk about a few things, some basic things about calculus. Well, like the word, what does calculus mean? It has Latin roots to the word, and it basically means to estimate or compute. It was developed in the 17th century by Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. They developed it basically simultaneously and independent of each other. Since I teach my classes from a biblical worldview, I think it's important for you to understand and to know that both of these men were Christians as well, and we'll be talking about them throughout the course of this book and talking about their lives as well. As Christians, both men were wanting to know God better through a study of his creation, and they developed calculus through a study of motion and a desire to measure instantaneous rates of change. That's a theme that we will discuss a lot as we go through the course of this book because that's the whole purpose of calculus the the fundamental purpose of it the founding purpose was to measure instantaneous rates of change and there in the 17th century that meant like measuring motion of projectiles planets pendulums sound and light it's important to know too that calculus in terms of what mathematics historians agree upon, they say that calculus is second only to Euclidean geometry in the development of mathematical thought throughout history. If you recall from advanced mathematics that Euclidean geometry is basically has that deductive reasoning process to it. Deductive reasoning is about applying rules. Inductive reasoning, that's about finding rules. In mathematics, we do lots of deductive reasoning. And in fact, Isaac Newton in his book, The Principia, he set that up similar to Euclid's book, The Elements. So just like Euclid's book, The Elements, has some basic rules or postulates, if you recall, they had ten postulates that, the, that Euclid's elements start with. Calculus also has its own set of postulates or rules that it starts with, and then you build and learn new things based on those rules. Let's go ahead and start part A of this lesson on real numbers and understanding what those are. Remember when you do a dive lesson you're supposed to write down everything that I put on the board and work all the practice problems that I work. It's a hands-on thing. You don't just sit back and watch what I'm doing. So put this table on your paper and we have these different sets of numbers here. Positive integers, integers, rational numbers, and real numbers. And we have some symbols that we use to represent those sets. And in the book, they have like kind of a fancy looking N for the positive integers. When you see an N like that, that's just to help you remember that's different from just the letter N. That's talking about the set of positive integers. Those are also called like counting numbers, like numbers, you, you know, if you're counting on your fingers, you wouldn't start with zero. You'd start with one, two, three, four, five, and on up. They're also called the natural numbers as well. So positive integers, zero is not positive or negative. That's why we start with one, two, three, four, and so on. They don't have any decimal values or decimal numbers as positive integers. And then Z, that symbol is used to represent all of the integers. That means negative ones, zero, and positive. Rational numbers, think about the word ratio. Ratio is a fraction, right? Rational numbers can be written as a ratio of integers. So one I didn't put on there in that set of examples is like 1.5. That is a rational number because that's the same thing as 3 over 2, a ratio of integers. And the Q is used to represent the rational numbers. Now if we can have rational numbers, why not have irrational numbers as well? Those would be numbers that cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers. And the irrational ones combined with the rational, those account for basically all numbers. That's the real numbers. And we use that R 
to represent the real numbers. And so we have some examples there. An irrational number would be like the square root of 5. The square root of 5 cannot be written as a ratio of integers, so that would be an irrational number. And it would be a member of the set of real numbers. Now, if we want to think about these different sets, we could think of them as subsets of each other as well, and there's a symbol that we can use. We can say that n, and I'm not going to use the fancy notation here, just show that n, understand I'm talking about the positive integers. That is a subset of, and we use like this horseshoe looking symbol, sideways u, and that means is a subset. n is a subset of the integers, z. So all of those positive integers are included in the set of integers, right? And then the rational numbers, those would go next because the positive integers and the integers are subsets of the rational numbers. All positive integers and all integers can be written as ratios. You just write a, put a 1 in the denominator. They can be all written as ratios of integers. And then all three of those sets are subsets of the real numbers. Here's another way to think about it. Let's use some circles here. And let's say that big circle, inside of that circle, is all of the real numbers. And so we'll just put an R there. Inside the real numbers, we have a set Q, which represents the rational numbers. Inside of that, we have some that are integers. And then inside that, we have some that are just positive integers. So basically we have a set within a set within a set within a set. Now one way we can compare real numbers is by using a number line, something we've been doing for quite a while, so that should be a familiar thing to be able to use. You just draw a line, put arrows on the ends, and then put some evenly spaced tick marks. Using graph paper is the best way to have evenly spaced tick marks, but if you don't have some graph paper, just try to draw them as evenly spaced as possible. And then usually they're labeled with integers, but you can make them any scale that you want to. Let's just, on this one, let's start with a negative 6 over here, and then let's put them negative 5, then this would be negative 4. I don't have enough room to write all the integers down, so I'll just do like every other one. Negative 2 would be there, then here would be 0 positive 2, positive 4, positive 6 there. Let's say you wanted to compare those two numbers, kind of see which one's greater, 1 1.2 or negative 3. You could just look on your number line, and you'd have to kind of estimate 1.2 because that would be between the 1 and the 2, but just it'd be closer to the 1, of course, than the 2. So you could put a dot right there to estimate its location. And then the negative 3, you would just put it right there on that tick mark representing negative 3. So number lines are a way for you to be able to compare real numbers. We see that negative 3 is to the left of 1.2, so anytime you have one number that's to the left of another one on a number line, you know that it's less than that number. And we can represent the comparison of these two numbers using inequality symbols. We could say that 1.2 is greater than negative 3, or we could say that negative 3 is less than 1.2. We could also say this as well, negative 3, put an equal sign and a slash through it, negative 3 is not equal to 1.2. So we use inequality symbols to help us compare numbers or compare sets of numbers as well. Now let's talk about some properties that we apply to our understanding of real numbers. These are on page two in your book, and if you did advanced math with me, maybe you remember that I told you to have like some kind of a notebook, like maybe a five by seven size spiral notebook that you should write different formulas, rules, axioms, postulates, properties, different things like that, that are not necessarily something that is super important to memorize, but it's something that you would want to know. Here, 
I have some order properties for real numbers. These are things that you would want to know. If you memorize them, that's great. That's awesome. That would be the best thing to do is to memorize them. But there's a lot to memorize. And so if you don't have them all completely memorized, it would be good to have somewhere that would be easy to reference and look up in case you needed to use one of these tools to help you solve a problem. Get a spiral notebook. Write these rules in your spiral notebook and have that as a reference. Keep that with you for homework and for tests. The most important thing is that you can apply things like these order properties in order to solve a problem, not that you have them all memorized. If you do memorize them, that's better, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is being able to apply rules like this in a new situation to solve a problem. Let's just look at these order properties for real numbers. If you had some variables, just assign some variable, variables, x, y, and z, if those represented real numbers, then number one, x could be less than y, or x could be equal to y, or x could be greater than y. That's sometimes called the trichotomy, trichotomy axiom. An axiom is a statement that we accept without proof. That's, it's kind of like a, a no-duh statement. Sometimes that's what I call axioms and postulates. They have to be so basic that it's just almost obvious that they're true. I mean, obviously, if you had two real numbers, they're going to be either greater than, one's going to be greater than the other, one will be less than the other, or they'll be equal to each other. No-duh, right? Another one is the transitivity axiom. If x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z. So, for example, if x was 1, y was 2, and z was 3, x would be less than y, y would be less than z, so no duh, x is going to be less than z as well because 1 is less than 3. The third one there is an addition property, and if x is less than y, or you could substitute any of those symbols in greater than or equal to, they all, they all would work here. If x was less than y, then x plus z would be less than y plus z. Likewise, if x was equal to y, then x plus z would be equal to y plus z. Euclid has ten postulates. If you remember Euclid's postulates from Algebra 2 and Advanced Mathematics, he has ten postulates, and the seventh one is basically what that statement 3 is saying there, except in the seventh postulate said if equals are added to equals, the sums are equal to each other. Here we're saying pretty much the same thing, except we can have an inequality involved as well. And then the last property in the order properties is multiplication. If z was positive and x was less than y, then x times z would be less than y times z. And then if z was negative and x was less than y, it's, you switch the inequality around. xz is greater than yz. So that one maybe takes a little bit more thought to it. Just think about this. If you had 2 was less than 5, and you multiplied both sides by a negative number, like a negative 2, let's say, then you'd end up with negative 4 less than negative 10. Think about that on a number line. Negative 4 is greater than negative 10, right? Because negative 10 would be to the left. So you have to switch the inequality around when you multiply both sides by a negative number. So we just proved why that works there. Hopefully that will help you remember that when you multiply both sides of an inequality, not an equality, but an inequality by a negative number, you have to switch that inequality symbol around. And the fifth order property there is about the reciprocal. If x and y are positive and x is less than y, then 1 over x is greater than 1 over y. Let's just say that x equaled 2 as an example and y equaled 3. So x is less than y there. So 1 over 2, that's greater than 1 over 3. So there are five properties there for you to memorize. Now there's another table on page two dealing with commutative, associative, distributive laws, identities, and inverses. 
I'm not going to spend any time on that, but those are things that you should know. So a wise student would write those down, not be lazy, write those down in your notebook that you're going to make. That's going to be your toolbox, basically, your mathematics toolbox. Anybody that ever builds anything, they have a toolbox and they use that set of tools to help them solve problems and to build things. Let's do a few practice problems dealing with inequalities and these types of problems are called quantitative comparison problems and you'll see some in your problem sets and these are also on the SAT test where it's like a multiple choice type of problem and your answer is A if quantity A is greater. See in this problem here we're comparing A and B. Your answer is A if quantity A is greater. Your answer is B if quantity B is greater. C if they're equal to each other and then D if the there wasn't enough information to solve the problem. So look at this problem. We want to compare 25 centimeters squared and 3.9 inches squared. Hopefully by now you're in calculus, you're one of the smartest students in the United States if you're doing calculus and the first thing you see there is, oh well they have different units and so you don't just blindly guess that A is the answer because you saw that there's different units. So you need to get that two values to have the same units, then you can compare them. And you think to yourself, well, there's 2.54 centimeters in an inch, so let's just change the inches squared to centimeters squared. And so you just say 3.9 inches squared. Remember how to do unit multipliers. You always write down what's given first, and then you multiply by your unit multiplier. 2.54 centimeters in one inch now that'll get rid of one of the inches in inches squared. So you really need to square this quantity in order to get rid of inches squared. Inches squared means inch times inch, right? So you have to multiply by that unit multiplier two times. And therefore, you end up with 3.9 times 2.54 squared. And that would be 25.16. Centimeters squared. So look, now we're comparing 25.16 centimeters squared with 25 centimeters squared. That means the quantity in column B is greater, so we would just say B for our answer. Look at this problem, another quantitative comparison problem. So when you see these quantitative comparison problems, just think to yourself, I have to compare quantities or numerical values. And you've been given here if x is greater than 2 and less than 10 and y is greater than negative 3 and less than 5, compare x and y. So we're trying to see which one might be greater or are they equal or just what's going on here. And a good thing to do on a problem like this where you have variables that you're comparing is to substitute numbers in. So we know that x is between 2 and 10 y is between negative 3 and 5, so x could be a 3 and y could be a 4, so in that case the answer would be b. Or x could be a 9 and y could be the same thing, right? It could still be a 4. Now the answer would be a. If you have a discrepancy like that, the answer is always D because it can't be both. The answer can't be both B and A. There was not enough information to tell if X was greater, Y was greater, or if they were equal to each other. So we say D. Let's go on to the second part of this lesson now on concept review and Let's just do a few practice problems to help us review some of the concepts that you'll be using and applying in learning calculus. Everything you're going to see here is things you've learned in Algebra 2 or Advanced Math or maybe even before that. So I'll help you remember these things by doing some practice problems. Remember, you're supposed to do everything with me. Don't just sit and watch me do it. If you need to rewind and listen to it again, then that's the purpose of the CD. That's what makes it better than doing a classroom lecture, a live classroom lecture, is that you can rewind the teacher. So let's go ahead and look at this problem, and I want you to find x2 or basically solve for 
x2. And so that means instead of saying a over x equals that relationship on the right, I want it to say x2 equals all the variables that are in there. First thing we want to do on a problem like this is get rid of our parentheses and keep in mind our algebra rules, addition and our multiplication rules, the two fundamental rules in algebra, and we'll use that distributive property to distribute the t on the right over the two relationships inside the parentheses, and we'd have t over x1 plus yt over x2. Now it's going to be very important in this problem that we keep up with our subscripts on the x's since we have an x, an x1, and an x2. So be careful about that. Next, before we start with our algebra rules of addition and multiplication, a good first step is to get rid of the fractions in the problems. And that means multiplying each term by the least common multiple of the denominators, which would be x times x1 times x2. If we multiply every term by that, then we can go ahead and cancel where we need to and get rid of the fractions. And the x's would cancel there, the x1's here, and the x2's in that last term on the right. And we'll end up with x1 x2a is equal to x x2t plus x x1yt. Now keep in mind what we're solving for. We're solving for x2. Now we can go ahead and use our addition rules to get all the x2 terms on one side and then we'll use multiplication rules of algebra to isolate the x2 variable. So let's add a negative x x2t to both sides, and I'll just put that one over here to the left, negative x, x2t, plus that, and so we'll get rid of that on the right-hand side, factor out an x2 on the left, x2 parentheses, negative xt, plus x1a is equal to x, x1, yt. And then you just divide both sides by that term in the parentheses, and you end up with x2 is equal to x, x1, yt over, I'll just put the positive term first, x1a minus xt. And there's our solution. We basically just rearranged that equation and solved it for x2. So that was just basically an algebraic equation there that we solved for one of the variables. That's called an abstract equation when it's just in terms of letters. There was no other numerical coefficients in there, just a bunch of letters. We didn't solve it for a numerical answer, we solved it for variables. Now, I'm not going to get into where you're going to use these in calculus right now. Just I guess you'll just have to trust me that you will be using these things in this book. That's why we're reviewing them now, to just kind of rebuild some of your strength in these areas. Let's go ahead and do another concept review problem, simplifying complex fractions. Remember what to do on these? First, you would simplify this fraction right here. Just get one denominator. Then you simplify this fraction then you simplify the whole denominator, and then you simplify the entire fraction. So basically there's going to be four simplifications in that problem. Each time we're trying to get one denominator where we have parts that are separated out. Doing these problems involves showing work just to keep up with your steps. So I'll just do 1 over x plus 1 over. Now to simplify that first fraction a plus 1 over y, we'd have to multiply that a by y over y to get a common denominator of y. And then we can just say this will be 1 over a y plus 1 over y. Now we'll simplify 
that particular fraction. And remember what you do on that, you multiply above and below by the reciprocal of the denominator fraction. So I'll put this in parentheses here and we'll say y over ay plus 1 and then the same in the numerator y over ay plus 1. When you multiply above and below by the reciprocal of a denominator fraction like that the entire denominator of the big fraction goes away and you just end up with put an equal sign here 1 over x plus y over ay plus 1. Now we need to multiply that x by ay plus 1 over ay plus 1 to get a common denominator again. This is our third simplification of fraction step here and now we'll end up with 1 over I'll just expand that out a y x plus x plus y over a y plus 1. Now think about it this fraction this whole thing right here is the denominator fraction if we multiply above and below by the reciprocal of that that will just cancel out that bottom part and we'll just end up with a y plus 1 over a y x plus x plus y. That's what simplification of a complex fraction means. You just have one numerator value and one denominator. There's no fraction in the numerator and no fraction in the denominator. Let's do another problem. On this one you see you have a radical sign in the denominator. On problems like that you want to rationalize the denominator and that's just a standard way to do the problem. It's not like it's wrong to leave it like it is. It's just that's usually the standard accepted way to do problems like this is to rationalize the denominator. In other words, don't have an irrational number in the denominator. So what we'll do here is multiply above and below by the conjugate of the denominator. Remember what that is? That would just be 11 plus the square root of 3. Remember if you multiply above and below by the same number, it's the same thing as multiplying by 1, right? So it doesn't change the number, it just changes the way it looks. And now what we do, we have binomials that we're multiplying, so we just expand those out. On the bottom we'd have 11 times 11 is 121, and then 11 times the square root of 3. Then we'll take the negative square root of 3, multiply that by 11, and we'd have minus 11 times the square root of 3. And then a negative square root of 3 times a square root of 3 would just be negative 3. So see what happens there? Those radical signs cancel out, and we end up with 118 as our denominator. Now let's just work on the numerator, and we have 5 times 11, that's going to be 55, and then 5 times the square root of 3. Then multiply the negative 4 times the square root of 3 by the two terms on the right, and we'd have negative 44 times the square root of 3, and then a minus 4 times square root of 3 times square root of 3 would be a minus 4 times 3, or a minus 12. And so the numerator is going to work out to add the 55 and the negative 12 together. So that would be a 43. And then the 5 times square root of 3 and the negative 44 times the square root of 3 would be a negative 39 times the square root of 3. All of that will be over 118. We can just leave our answer like that. We have rationalized the denominator. The denominator is no longer an irrational number and that's what our goal when we see a problem like that where we have an irrational number or a number with a radical sign. Anytime you see that with a radical sign you want to eliminate that from the denominator. 
complex numbers work the same way. If you have a complex number in the denominator, you want to get a real number in the denominator, so you multiply above and below by the conjugate of that complex number. Look at problem B. Let's simplify that expression. A to the x plus 2, B to the x minus 3, over A to the 3x, and B to the x minus 4. Now, the first thing I like to do in a problem like that where you have these exponents is, and then you also recognize that you have some similar bases, is just make everything, put it all up in the numerator. And the way you do that, remember, if it's in the denominator, you can put it in the numerator by just changing the sign of the exponent. And we'll have A to the x plus 2, a to the negative 3x, b to the x minus 3, b to the minus x over 4. Now we can simplify further because when we have similar bases multiplied together, that means we can add the exponents. So we can have a to the minus 2x plus 2. Now, why, why is that? Just think about it. x plus 2 minus 3x. Just, you could even do that over to the side. Just add the exponents up over to the side. x plus 2 minus 3x. You should see that that's equal to minus 2x plus 2. And then b, the exponents there are x minus 3 and a negative x over 4. So that means we'll end up with 3 fourths x minus Three. Negative x over 4 is the same thing as negative 1 fourths x, right? And then plus that positive x, we'd have to just call that a 4 over 4 times x instead of just plus 1x. And that's how we get 3 fourths x. This would be the simplification of that expression. And that was practice problem F. I don't know why I called it practice problem B. Let's do a couple more problems and we'll be done with this lesson. Keep in mind these first few lessons are going to be the longest ones in the book because there's lots of review here. So just be patient. Most of your lessons will be nowhere near this long. Look at problem G. On this one I want you to factor. And so what you have to do on this is find the greatest common factor between those two terms. And the first thing you should do is just look at the numerical coefficients. And you see you have an 8 and a 16, or a negative 16. And so the greatest common factor that they have is an 8. So we could just start with an 8. And we know we'll have that much. Now, what I like to do when I have a sum in the exponent is to just think about if I have similar bases multiplied together, you can add the exponent. So you could just rewrite this 8 parentheses, x to the 4a, x to the 4, instead of saying x to the 4a plus 4, because it's the same thing, right? x to the 2 plus 2, isn't that the same thing as x squared times x squared, which would be x to the 4th? In the same way, if you have variables in the exponent, you can think of it the same way. And then we would have a minus 2x to the 2a, x to the 4. Now, why did I do it like that? Because for me, anyway, it's easier to see what the common factors are. Now, it's easy to see that they both have an x to the 4 in common, and they both have at least an x to the 2a. So we could rewrite this as 8, x to the 4, x to the 2a, parentheses, x to the 2a minus 2. And that would be the factored form of that expression. So when you see a problem like that, when you have a sum in the exponent, remember that you can rewrite that as a product of bases. And it's easier to see what to factor out then. Practice problem H, I want you to factor this out as well. And sometimes what you just have to do is recognize when you have a sum or a difference of two squares or two cubes. And on page four in your book at the bottom in example nine, they have some formulas there for the sum and difference of two cubes. 
you might want to write those down in your spiral notebook where you're writing different formulas just so you can have that to refer back to. The key to doing those problems though is of course recognizing that you have a sum or difference of two cubes. And a lot of times when you factor expressions, that's something that you're doing, that they set up the problems to, to make you factor a sum or difference of two cubes. So in this problem you can kind of see there that you have 27a to the cube. Well 27 would be 3 cubed, right? And then everything's in terms of powers of 3. So we could just rewrite this problem as 3 a cubed plus b squared c cubed to the third power. And to factor that out, just use that formula on page 4, and you would just say 3a plus b squared c cubed parentheses the 3a term squared, which would be 3 times 3 is 9, a times a is a squared, minus the two terms multiplied together, so that would be 3a b squared c cubed, plus that second term squared, so that would be b to the fourth, c to the sixth. And there's your factored form of that expression. It's longer than the original expression, but it doesn't mean that that's, we weren't simplifying here, we were factoring this out. The only way to do those problems correctly is to recognize that you have maybe a sum or difference of squares, sum or difference of cubes, and then you can factor those expressions. Let's do one more problem. This is a common problem in calculus, a summation type of problem. And let's sum from i equals 1 to 4 of i squared. I put x squared in there, but that wouldn't make any sense because we have to substitute values of i into that relationship, whatever it is there. So we have i squared from i equals 1 to 4 of i squared. So what we do, we remember that sigma symbol there. That means summation. And so when i equals 1, we'd have 1 squared. We add to that when i equals 2, that would be 2 squared, and then 3, and then 4. So we add those four values together. We'd have a 1 plus a 4 plus a 9 and a 16. So 1 and 4 is 5, 9 and 16 is 25. We end up with 30 for that relationship. On summation problems, when you have this range of numbers to substitute in, those are integer values. We don't do like 1 and then 1.1, 1.2, or whatever. Always assume that you're substituting integer values in to that relationship. It's kind of like a function where you substitute into a function, substitute a number in to solve it. Well, here you just su substitute multiple times in and you add those results together. Okay, so in this lesson we've talked a little bit about what calculus is and we've talked about some concept review, some things that we're going to use basically in our understanding of calculus. Hopefully by doing this review it's coming back to you a little bit now and you'll, you're seeing that all of this stuff is familiar. And that's basically what you'll be doing in calculus is applying things that you already know in new situations. Okay, well that's all for lesson one.